Welcome back to the Open Web Forum at COGEX, curated by Fabric Ventures. If you're in London and had a lovely lunch in the sun, make sure to put on some sun cream. Personally, after months locked away inside, 30 minutes in the sun, and I'm pink as a flamingo. But as my room heats up, so does our afternoon. We're kicking off with a double header of data economy panels. Moderating the first of these is the superbly eloquent and witty Stuart Rogers, a journalist, analyst, public speaker, author, startup founder, musician, and digital nomad. His primary role is editor-in-chief at Data Economy, where he informs the data science and AI communities, but previously spent seven years at VentureBeat as analyst at large and now MC. Over to you, Stuart. Well, thank you so much, Ian. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, welcome to your latest session at COGX. Uh, can I just remind everybody that uh, we're going to talk about uh, some wonderful topics here, but uh, you are going to want to ask questions. So in hop in, uh, on that right hand side, you've got uh, chat, polls, and Q&A. Uh, feel free at any time to click the Q&A tab and then put in your questions. And they'll be fed through to us. Um, we may ask them as we go. Uh, or we may hold them off till the end, depending on if they fit the flow of our conversation or not. Uh, but yes, do go ahead. Make sure you click that Q&A tab uh, and put your questions in there. They'll be fed through. So uh, without further ado, uh, I'm going to introduce each one of my guests. But actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask them to briefly introduce themselves, but most importantly, ask them why uh, bringing talent into the open web is a very important topic for them. Uh, David, would you like to join us first? Tell everybody who you are, uh, a little bit about what you do, and then why this topic is so important to you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Stuart, and it's great to be here. Uh, so I'm David Schreier. I am a professor of practice with Imperial College Business School focused on artificial intelligence and innovation. I'm also the CEO of Esme Learning Solutions, which is an MIT spin-out company. And both of these roles have me thinking a lot about the question of how do we use technology to harness collective intelligence and create a, a better future and, and a, a more functional society. Uh, and so open web is, is intricately linked with this because we are taking contributions from many different people. We're taking crowd intelligence to create better technology. And so what I'm interested in and what we're working on both in the, in the work at Imperial and also with, with SMA Learning is, is how can we use AI to, to make that process better? Excellent. Thank you, David. Uh, Manip, could you uh, let everybody know who you are, what you do, and why this topic is important to you? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Manip. I'm co-founder of Stacks. Uh, Stacks is a <clears throat> crypto uh, project. We bring smart contracts to Bitcoin. Uh, the background on me is I did a uh, PhD in distributed systems at Princeton University, and, and I uh, started off in the crypto industry in uh, around 2013. And over the early years, I've definitely noticed that this is such a rich area. Like we're talking about uh, almost like re-decentralization of the web uh, and uh, the amount of kind of like, you know, sophisticated engineers and computer scientists working in the area uh, remain to be relatively low. So over the last years, I've actually tried hard uh, convincing peers uh, in my network to join, join this industry. Uh, along with like starting courses at different universities and trying to basically raise awareness for the uh, for the technologies that that crypto brings and also for the opportunities that are there in this industry. Excellent, thank you so much, Muni. And uh, last but very much not least, uh, Josh, will you uh, tell us who you are, what you do, and why this is important to you? Hey, everyone. Yeah, it's glad to be here. Um, so this kind of actually this gets rooted in. Um, Back when I dropped out of college, so actually originally back in the day, I had received almost a full ride to study economics at university. And I had decided to uh, drop out to pursue a different path, which was to play professional poker. Now, during that period, I was you know, pretty fascinated that you could use your brain effectively in the internet connection to, in a peer-to-peer uh, fashion to um, kind of earn a living, right? Now, after this period, I had shifted over towards uh, actually creating my first startup in the, in the general uh, cashback, poker cashback industry. After I kind of transitioned away from that there, I moved into kind of consulting and I got exposed to open source like frameworks such as WordPress, Joomla, Drupal. And I built a lot of, uh, you know, I was able to build a living through uh, leveraging open source technology. So I realized pretty young in my 20s before I was like, you know, at that stage, maybe 26, 27 years old, that uh, this open source kind of world 
it can really, really impact a lot of individuals and creators. So that's kind of the origin story for me. Excellent. Thank you all. And uh, thank you all for being here. Um, so, you know, my first question is this. I mean, we're talking about how do we attract talent to the open web? And open web means a lot of different things to a lot of people. I mean, uh, you know, in the case of, uh, of, of your definition, Mini, we're talking about uh, using blockchain and, and decentralization protocols to, to change the way that the internet works. Um, and as we know, you know, there are, there are lots of projects um, out there that are doing this, but, you know, it presupposes that we're having a problem attracting talent to the open web. So let's talk about the problem first. Um, yeah, David, in, in your mind, what is the thing that's stopping us from getting the best talent into open the open web, in, web industry? Uh, we're seeing extraordinary growth in uh, um, key open web domain spaces like blockchain and crypto. And so, you know, the, just the number of companies that need technical talent are spiraling up and the number of open job positions are spiraling up and, and the, the manufacturing of new talent, people who are skilled in, in these technologies uh, is, is having trouble keeping pace. Um, and it's certainly something we're working on with the, the classes that we do with universities like uh, Oxford and MIT and others. But, uh, uh, but it is something where, you know, there is a need for more support for training and for reskilling. There are some people who are, either in non-technical professions or people who are in technical roles, but on kind of old school systems. Um, and they need to be reoriented towards the open web economy. Uh, and so more support is needed around that. Um, I think we, we also are, are seeing sort of a, a, a philosophical shift where we're finally getting widespread acceptance of um, the incorporation of open source solutions into mainstream technology deployments. I can remember, this is not so long ago, you know, maybe six years ago, the CTOs at all the major banks would forbid use of open source technology. And if you were a vendor trying to sell into them, you actually had to attest in your contract that you didn't use open source. That attitude has started to change and that's now creating more demand for open web capabilities. So you're seeing a huge increase of demand, not enough increase of supply. And we're also urgently facing a need to just train more people in these new technologies because the old world of jobs are going away. Mani, but you know, I'm sure you agree with all that, but is there also a, is there also somewhat um, a, if I put a small startup number one that's trying to create the decentralized internet on my CV, it's not as good as putting Google or Amazon or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Is, is that another issue for us? Um, I think I think potentially, yes. Uh, even though some of the uh, technical challenges in this industry are, are very intellectually interesting, so a lot of people do get attracted to that. I, it's actually, honestly, like to me, it's a, it's somewhat of a puzzle uh, because when I, when I think about crypto, more specifically, not the broader uh, open web, uh, there is no lack of funding. Like a lot of these projects are sitting on hundreds of millions of dollars in war chests. Uh, there's a there's no lack of like interesting problems to solve. Like um, as an engineer, you know, you could be diving into really intellectually curious things and and building new stuff, and you feel really like you're on the cutting edge of uh, of technologies. But I think there's something still missing because we're not seeing. Uh, uh, the type of talent that really should be coming to this area, uh, it's not really coming, right? And it's it's almost like a little bit of a puzzle for me. And we've been we've been trying to crack it from from different angles, but I I think it's safe to say that there is something going on that is stopping people from from um, jumping into this area uh, in, in 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 a way that I would expect. Yeah, for sure. Um, and everybody that uh, is watching at home, I hope you've got your uh your online broadcast bingo card, because we already had a You're Muted. Um, I'm really hoping that uh, Josh, at some point, a pet jumps onto your lap, because uh, that's always the hardest to tick off. Um, I mean, what's your view on, on all of this, Josh? Uh, is it a technical thing? Is it a uh, is it a prestige thing? Is it something else? You know, where do you think the issue lies? Well, it's complicated. I mean, we have, you know, unfortunately, a bad history of fraud and scams, right? So this has given a really bad name to our industry. So I think uh, moving forward, I think, uh, you know, if you're going to ICO, you need to do things such as uh, have milestone based funding, right? Have the in, in which the DAO itself controls the, uh, the keys and, and it can determine whether or not the funding is released. Um, I think that is probably the biggest impediment, 
impediment. You don't necessarily want to be affiliated with that when there's just so much garbage, even though you know that this is probably the future and you don't really necessarily like the standard kind of client server centralized model because we've seen repeatedly uh, what the problems with that. So I think it's a kind of a reputational issue here that we need to solve. Yeah, I mean, uh, just expanding on that a touch. Um, I mean, I've been covering blockchain industry for, for a while. Um, I don't remember a time when a regular startup with an app or a website product service came up to me and say, hey, do you want to see my latest JavaScript technology product? I mean, why are we even mentioning blockchain? Why, did, why does anyone care what's behind it other than trying to warm up the VCs to give you more money in the same way that AI has been used for that purpose? Um, uh, David, is, is that is that what you think? I mean, should we just not talk about blockchain? Why does anyone need to know what it's built on? Yeah, well, a, a couple of things, particularly for technical talent. So, so one of them is they want to know which problems they're working on, right? And, and distributed ledger offers in certain projects the opportunity to get involved in more computationally interesting problems. And, and the best engineers and hackers really like to work on interesting problems. Um, but but there's another dimension to this reputational angle, which is where you know organizations like Fabric Ventures and others can can help out. Which is, um, you know, there are a lot of shady projects out there, and there are a lot of repu reputable projects out there. How do you tell the difference? And more broadly, whether it's for blockchain or for any kind of open web project, you know, if you're an engineer and you're making a good living somewhere, even as a consultant, you can just make cash, pay your bills, store some money, buy some Bitcoin, whatever you want to do with your money. And someone comes up to you and says, cut your salary by 75% and take some tokens and equity instead. How do you know that that's going to be worth something? And that's where the pedigree of a reputable funder who says, this business is backed, it's going to be around for a while, have no fear, can be very helpful in de-risking that move for the best technical talent. Yeah, very good point. I mean, many let's. I mean, we've talked about the problem and uh, and you know why we might be having an issue getting the talent in. But let's talk about some of the things that they can look forward to uh, when they do uh, get into open web startups and start trying to solve those problems. I mean, what are some of the bigger challenges that uh, you're facing right now uh, that you need people to come in and try and solve for you? Yeah, so I think I think the interesting thing is um, at the early stages of the project, I used to uh, joke with people that I would I would work on this for free, right? Like as a, as a computer scientist, like it's just fascinating, like trying to uh, imagine that you know uh, the people who were working on the early internet, like the late eighties or early nineties, there was a sense of excitement because like these things have never been done before, and uh, you're taking something from zero to one. But if you if you look at the, the type of work that happened uh, since the internet was created, you're generally trying to do some sort of an incremental improvement, right? So you, if something already exists, you're trying to make it a little bit faster, or you know, you're you're trying to use the technology in like some new way and so on. But but crypto today is basically that zero to one type of a thing all over again, right? Like there there is almost like a completely new type of infrastructure that is being built. Like, you know, you can think of that as a decentralized web or a crypto internet or so on. And uh, you right now have the opportunity to be the part of the early days and the part of the foundational layers uh, that are being built. And for, purely from a technical or engineering perspective, like that kind of excitement is very different from working on something that is very incremental. Yes, indeed. Um, yeah, how about you, Josh? Uh, what do you see as, as some of the things that would really attract people in terms of technical challenges or, or problems that they need to help you solve? Yeah, certainly it's a very complex technology. And uh, and because of that, it's, it's endless on um, the kind of things you need to think about. And in addition to that, you're, you're thinking about tech, but you also think about economic systems, right? So it is, uh, it's an adventure. There's so much to think about and to be thinking uh, forward towards now, beyond that, though, um, I think the most important thing for to attract, uh, you know, the, the next generation developers, they actually have to be coming from the right place in the heart, so to speak. Like, this is technology, like, you know, this world is kind of, you know, co covered in darkness, basically. You know, silo databases to, you know, backhand, you know, under the table deals. And this technology is basically brings everything into the light by the transparency, by what it is, right? So. People need to, and the developers that come to this kind of uh, you know ecosystem, right? And this can really counter counteract the other forces of 
you know, like all that, uh, you know, the the bad reputation that this this industry has gained over the last several years through all the kind of easy, get rich quick kind of Ponzi schemes. You come here to, you know, basically secure food supply chains, right? You come here to make sure that uh, individuals can own their own data and that, you know, you can monetize your own data in certain ways. You come here to make the world more efficient, right? Then, then you come for like generational, generational changing, like impact driven, like social positive impact, right? And this is something that is going to affect the generations of. of I don't think that this is ever going to change. Actually, this is one of those paradigm shifting moments. And if you want to participate in that, then uh, you know, if you if you want to make this world a better place for your children or their children for Mars, right? <laughs> It, it's it's not going to go away. You know, this technology is going to be part of what humans expect. That's that's what I believe. Excellent, thank you, Josh. Uh, before I ask uh, you three wonderful people my next question, uh, just a reminder for the audience. So, uh, when you're watching us, you want to be on the stage. Uh, at the top, you've got like event and stage on the right hand side. You want to be on stage, and then you want to click on Q and A. Uh, so make sure you're on stage Q and A, and then uh, you can ask us questions, and we will weave those into our conversation for you. Uh, so we want to hear your voice as well. So please go ahead and click on stage and Q and A, and, and ask any questions you want. Um, so look, David, uh, thinking about what Joshua just said logically, does that mean that realistically, open web is going to attract the activist developer, the activist UX designer, the you know, activist executive, you know, is it, is it is it going to attract those people that have ambitions to leave the world a better place than, you know, the one they came into? Well, I would argue, certainly in the case of distributed ledger, it started there, right? It began with activists and then broadened. Uh, and, and so I'm, for example, a non-executive director with, with Copper uh, Technologies, who you, you may have seen just raised a pretty sizable B round. And, and um, you know, Copper is bringing uh, blockchain into mainstream financial services in a really interesting way, uh, in a very robust way. Um, and the kind of people there are, I think, interested in helping support a reshaping of the core infrastructure of financial services versus, you know, some of the people I talked to at the earlier days of, of the, the Bitcoin revolution were really talking about tearing down everything and building something completely new. Um, those are not actually incompatible points of view. I think there's a pretty broad range of things that people can work on. Uh, and, and I've written a lot actually on this idea of, you know, ideologically motivated technologists and the, you know, the more sort of technocrats. Uh, but, uh, but I will say that, um, you know, there is an opportunity to change the world. If that's what motivates you, there are a number of very interesting projects out there uh, in the crypto community that are social good oriented first. And, and, uh, and they're more common. Yeah, absolutely, for sure. I mean, if we, you know, if we look at the uh, the various uh, steps that are trying to solve the uh, rampant centralization of the internet, for example, I mean, we we have ended up in a situation where uh, the internet is is run by you know six huge companies, and uh, then the connections between those companies are run by just a, a small number of uh, telecommunications operators, and that is not the hello world. Uh, internet that Tim Berners-Lee envisaged. It was supposed to be an internet uh, by the people, for the people. Uh, and of course, Tim Berners-Lee is now running, uh, you know, solid as a, an alternative. Uh, you have the likes of Threefold who've uh, managed to build the, the largest decentralized, you know, peer-to-peer -peer internet so far. One of the things that both of them tell me uh, is they don't have the same uh, ideas of competition that a lot of uh, people who are embedded in late stage capitalism seem to have. Uh, you know, competition is kind of interesting. It presupposes that everyone else has to lose and you're the only winner, which is not necessarily a healthy way for us all to live our lives. So, you know, they're quite happy for everyone to exist in the decentralized internet space and for all of them to talk to each other, because that is, after all, what we're, we're trying to get back to. I mean, does that sit well with you, Maneeb? Is that, uh, you know, is it, a, is it a winner takes all or is it, uh, you know, a new way of bringing a new internet to life that where many people can coexist. Yeah, I think I think um, we get that question a lot, right? Like, is this a winner takes take all market, or is it are are there going to be multiple uh, kind of like blockchains and ecosystems, and they would coexist, they would like interconnect with each other, and 
my, my view is generally that it's too early to tell. Like people can have different kind of like you know models for how this might play out, but it's it's really too, too early to tell. Right now, we do see a bunch of uh, competition between different projects. Like they tend to be highly competitive, and there are also uh, very enthusiastic communities that support each project as well. And there could be some somewhat of a uh, tribal mindset of like, hey, no, my this way of doing things is better than that way of doing things. Uh, but I think in general, the entire industry is also expanding faster than anyone can expect. So there's lots of room for everyone to grow uh, for a while. And at some point, my, my personal guess is we might start seeing some sort of consolidation happen. Uh, where some of the some of the projects that end up uh, kind of like winning in 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 different sorts of ways, like it doesn't need to be like a single player, basically just takes the entire market. But it and we might see some consolidation happening. Right now, we're expanding. Right now, more and more experiments are happening, and 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 more projects are starting rather than any 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 uh, signs of consolidation. Yeah, which is excellent news. Um, I mean, we do need to find a solution to this uh, this this centralization of the internet. Uh, and especially when we talk about uh, some of the topics that we've already touched on, like uh, data sovereignty, for example, um, you know, this idea that we've all been giving up all of our data to major corporations who then make billions from us without us getting any reward back uh, is, is kind of nefarious. Um, and we would hope that there is a, a global solution to that. Um, certainly, I've not been inspired by the governmental solutions to it, which uh, by and large are designed to, to tax for large companies and then uh, put the money into uh, just a few people and not everyone that's been offering their data, which uh, for me is just as bad as taking the data and making money off of it and, uh, from you know, the likes of Google and Facebook and everybody else. I mean, you know, Joshua, can we, can we solve both of these problems at once with, with blockchain technology, both the idea of uh, making the internet and everything that runs on the internet more open, more transparent, or decentralized and simultaneously solving the data sovereignty problem and making sure that people are given fair reward for giving up their data. I don't think it's going to happen all at once. I think it's going to happen over the arc of at least 10 years. Um, I think there's multiple different layers to this. I, I actually think the centralization kind of dynamic is kind of a natural dynamic. I don't think it's intentional necessarily. Well, I mean, you can always argue you know, the profit motive. That's a whole other discussion to have that. Um, I think the way that this kind of unfolds is we you have the existing internet, and then you also have a peer-to-peer -peer kind of infrastructure uh, that's just individuals running nodes at their house or Wi-Fi connections or you know um, different types of uh, uh, mesh networks, right? And then I think what happens is also individuals over time will have to uh, basically have what are called personal data lakes, right? Where you kind of accumulate all your information in kind of a structured and unstructured manner, and you can start to interact with other applications and using randomized identities and uh, you know kind of different kind of decentralized identity tools and uh, and then what happens is if we can actually get to that stage the dynamic switches right and we move into a, a dynamic in which uh, you know advertisers or other other you know you know services they have to obey your like your desire right and they have to be of service to you right right now for us to use these other services we have to play by their rules. But if we kind of, we have to build this core infrastructure, including, you know, the mesh networks, et cetera, but also our own personal data lakes, et cetera, and allow this to interact with other services and then let the best service that's, you know, catering to your needs um, win. And, you know, this includes like, uh, like um, you know, algorithms that, uh, you know, you're, you're for your feed that you can actually tweak. So open sourcing the algorithms and feeds um, and, uh, you know, uh, we've seen this time and time again in many different industries, the pendulum swings, right? And we're getting to a point where the pendulum has swung a little bit too far, and you've seen it in society's reaction to this. So it's about to come back, but, you know, that took 10 years or more to get to that stage, maybe 20 years, right? So this is going to be a slow and steady process, and I think the end result is somewhere in the middle. Yeah, that's a very interesting point. Um, I mean, if we think about... Uh, if we think about those cycles, um, you know, whenever anybody creates something that is going to cause cultural change, uh, we know that even at the incredible speed of technological advancement, it takes a generation before it becomes mainstream. Uh, it's always the truth. Um, it gets worse from there because if 
by making that cultural change, you also uh, are basically threatening people who have a lot of money and power in the status quo. Uh, it's either going to take very much longer than you think, or you're going to need uh, billions of dollars in a slush fund to, to buy them off. <laughs> so how, how are we going to, I mean, we, we can, this is the start, as we're saying, this is the start of, of uh, this new way of, you know, building uh, an open web the way that it should have been. Uh, so we do have a way to go, but is there any way that we can accelerate that process? Um, you know, can we find ways to accelerate it? And if we can, uh, doesn't that make the open web industry more exciting for potential talent? David, what do you think? Well, I, I mean, there are several ways to accelerate it. Um, one of the uh, factors that, that drives uh, more rapid adoption of new technologies is uh, some other kind of exogenous disruption. Um, so, for example, you know, radar and artificial intelligence were both born during World War II as a result of great chaos and, and, and change. Uh, and, and so we've just had a pandemic. This had all sorts of unexpected knock-on consequences, like, for example, the more rac rapid acceptance of mRNA technology, where now they're talking about having an AIDS vaccine because of the same technologies that were used to create the COVID vaccine, which were accelerated by 18 years in development. Uh, due to a crisis. So, um, so, so, so out of crisis, there can come opportunity. Um, the, the other way we can drive change fat, so it's just recognizing that there was a crisis that had a huge impact on data sharing of health data, and we actually mishandled it. <laughs> we could have handled it better, and we could have used blockchain in, in part to help audit what's happening with all this health data flying around, and we didn't. Uh, so that was a missed opportunity, but now we can jump in and take advantage of it because there will be another pandemic. Now that we're sensitized, we can do something about it. Um, but there's also regulatory and government action. So GDPR and PSD2 were two enormous uh, uh, milestone achievements to sort of help users reclaim their data and reclaim their personal information and reclaim their privacy. And that was a, was a, a, a beacon or a lighthouse uh, piece of legislation that then is being imitated elsewhere, like with the CCPA in the US and, and other countries around the world. So um, having the opportunity to drive uh, those kind of mandates to support the benefit to the individual of um, more open data, more uh, personal privacy power and control, uh, uh, creates opportunity. And so uh, uh, we see more of that coming in the near term. The EU, for example, not only is working on a major piece of blockchain legislation, but also some major AI legislation, which could have tremendous benefit for consumers and make the open web opportunity of convergence of AI and blockchain together really exciting for developers. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Minnie, what's your view on this? Uh, so I think, I think in many ways, um, there are significant financial incentives um, this time around compared to how open source was developed earlier, or even if, if you look at the early days of the internet, uh, people were just working on these open protocols just because they were interested in working in them, right? And that that uh, that can be a slow process, right? So if you think about you know the early implementations of like TCP/IP there was like no direct financial incentive for anyone to kind of like you know, spend their time and effort building, building that out, but people still did because it was an interesting thing to do. Whereas if you compare uh, that time to now, these crypto networks uh, almost come with financial incentives baked in uh, for, for some of the early uh, operators or early backers or early developers of, of these systems. And I think that does actually help accelerate the rate of innovation by a lot. And we're, we're seeing that happen. Like crypto already is like, you know, sitting at like $1.5 trillion worth of an industry. And that's just in the last five, six years or so. And I think that's that's very, very uh, rapid change. And I think these incentives are, uh, when these incentives combined with open protocols and open source software is something that maybe have simply like not never seen before. Excellent. Uh, Joshua, what would you like to say on this topic? Yeah, actually, I, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, I think um, uh, token economics and these crypto incentives, uh, incentives basically are, you know, they, they, they rule everything we do. So um, thinking that, uh, you know, the accelerants are, you know, these incentive structures, as well as also, let's think about the other side. So from a centralized kind of uh, framework, right, the accelerant might be regulation and also, you know, 
if it becomes untenable to centralize the data because of leaks and hacks, right, and becomes a liability, then you're going to want to architect your software differently and your platform differently. So I think both of those are going to be probably the two strongest forces at play here. Um, yeah, I think that's kind of my point of view. Excellent, thank you. Um, listen, we've got a, a question from the uh, from the audience that I'd like to uh, just weave in here. Um, you know, we we touched on you know whether the open web is going to attract uh, everybody or just the activists of this world. Uh, you know, but uh, the question is, if you're a startup wanting the best talent, do you appeal to the heart or the wallet or both? Uh, Maneep, do you want to take that one first? Uh, I can I can share the approach that we take. Um, we basically we try to match the salaries in the market uh, in terms of like the base salaries, so that people don't feel like they're actually taking a, a salary cut and they're taking needless risk by coming to a uh, coming to a new area. But then we try to heavily incentivize on uh, on on the crypto side because if you're if you're early and you're right and the work that you were doing actually ended up making a difference to the world, uh, you share uh, the upside, right? But in in general, like these incentives are mostly uh, kind of like it, we we view them as like it's something that needs to be there so that people can feel like they're not taking needless risk. For example, by taking a salary cut and so on. But you really have to convince people that th that at an intellectual level that this is the thing that you should be working on or you should be uh, getting joy out of this uh, on a daily basis because you're working on open source code you're contributing directly uh, to technology that can bring so much good to the world and i think that's the thing that uh, really drives it but you want to make sure you watch out for the wallet enough so that it's not a um, it's not it's not a roadblock for someone to make that decision Excellent, thank you. Um, you know, Josh, before I come to you to, to ask that question, uh, we have had another question come in that you know, maybe just uh, adds a little color to this. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Raghavendra. Um, Raghavendra says, uh, you know, offer competitive compensation for open source contributions, grant short and midterm internships, and uh, you know, revolutionize employment process and space. Um, he's asking for any ideas you know, there. Uh, you know, are those some good ideas, or are there other ways that uh, that we can attract people? And is it is it just attracting them, uh, you know, because of their heart or their wallet? Is this for me? Yeah, Josh. Yeah. Sure, sure. Um, I think you're okay. So if you're attracting like co-founders and founding team, you have to you have to go for the heart, and you you know you also have to be intellectually stimulated, right, and and intrigued by this, right? Um, but uh, you know. Like, for example, I started my first uh, crypto lab in late 2017, 2018, immediately hit the bear market, right? So if I was just in it for the money for a quick buck, I wouldn't have the endurance. So you have to you have to find partners that can make it through. Now now that we're actually getting, you know, funding and uh, from some great names, um, uh, you know, you have and we're recruiting, right? You have to be competitive. But you also have to align, you know, you, know, you, you want to have smart people that have ethics, right? You don't want to have, you know, smart people without ethics. Like I think Ray Dalio talks about this. How that's like the the worst, the most dangerous combination. So you want to make sure that they they follow kind of the same general ethos as you, and uh, they see the long term visions. They're on the same page. So that yes, when they do hit roadblocks, because this technology is hard, that they'll stick it through. Um, I agree that uh, you know competitive salaries and also the potential upside. Um, is important. So, you know, thinking holistically about a package is is definitely meaningful. Excellent. Thank you. Um, David, take us uh, to the end of this question, please. Heart, wallet, both. What can you yeah, say about I'll, I'll, I'll be brief. So, so, um, so I've trained about 20,000 entrepreneurs in, in my career, and, and about half of them are in blockchain, as it happens. And, and one of the things that I've learned we have to focus on when training tech entrepreneurs is storytelling. You need to inspire people with a vision. So that vision includes heart and wallet. And so what's important is to figure out how to capture the idea of what you're working on in a really crisp narrative that compels people to, to want to jump in and be part of building it. Excellent, thank you. Um, all right, so I've got to ask one more question. Um, you know, we want to attract talents of these brilliant projects. They, they could potentially make a huge difference to all of our lives uh, and do all sorts of incredible things. Um, what should be, if you're a founder of a new startup trying to tackle these open web problems, 
As far as attracting talent is concerned, what would be the very first thing that you would do uh, in order to get out there and, and attract the right people to these projects? Uh, so, Mini, what's the one thing and the first thing? Uh, I, would, I would say that trying to articulate the why, right? Like uh, in, in the sense that what has worked for me has been basically talking to people in my network and just explaining to them that why did I get excited? Like what was the aha moment for me where I just knew that this is the, the, the only thing I, I'll be working on for decades to come and just like sharing that uh, passion. And I think so sometimes people, um, people can mirror that, right? Or, or they can also start kind of like viewing the world from the, from the same lens. So I think focusing on the why, like why did you do it? And why does it matter to you? Why are you passionate about it? Is probably the first thing I would, I would look at. Excellent. Joshua, what's your first thing and one thing? Yeah, I mean, uh, the big what if, what if we're right, right? If we're right, we make a huge impact. And this is going to be generational, right? So this is, uh, you know, it's, it's meaningful because of what it means for the rest of, you know, the species. We're talking about financial inclusion for everyone. We're talking about the, the right to an identity, you know, the right to kind of make money on the internet through your brain and through your own you know that kind of thing so the impact is just to me it's just it's so great that you know if worst case scenario you're going to learn how to become a great computer scientist right <laughs> just like and then the upside is just huge i mean the impact but also i mean it seems like these blockchain founders are doing quite well not that that is the motivating factor but this is one of those things that i think that um being an activist so to speak right and i say that lightly that you know um is it, you can also get very you know wealthy and um, you know that's not really the core driver but it's for some people it is right um, but I think really the most important is you know knowing that if we're right as an industry this is going to transform you know the world so excellent thank you sir. Uh, David tell us your one thing and first thing yeah the, find your authentic story right so when you're at zero stage people are going to be jumping into a project because you've inspired them to want to work with you. And if your authentic story encapsulates things like, I want to change the world, I want you know everyone to have low cost or no cost access to financial services, or I want everyone to get control of their personal data, or whatever your mission is, if you identify that authentic narrative and you can express it to people, A, they will also get to understand what problem they're working on. And, and you know that gets exciting for developers, but B, they will be able to form a personal connection with you, and that's what's going to drive your early recruitment. Excellent. Uh, I'm going to just chip in for 20 seconds with my thoughts. Uh, expand your recruitment circles and make sure that you already start your project with a diverse and equal and inclusive team, because uh, not because it's ne necessarily you want to do it because of uh, it, the fact that it's morally correct to do so, although that's important, but if you have every person on your team uh, from every background, you will design something that will appeal to every person on the planet and not just one group of people, which tends to happen if you only have one group of people on your team. So that's why diversity, inclusion, and equality are important. I would urge everybody to do that too. So thank you so, so much, David, Munib, Josh. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, speaking with you on this subject. I found it fascinating. And now back to Ian. Thank you, Stuart. A veritable masterclass in moderating. And to Josh, Manib, David, thank you for your fantastic insights. There's no doubt in my mind that recruiting is one of the biggest barriers really facing our industry. And it's one that we at Fabric Ventures endeavor to support our portfolio with. And data sovereignty equally is some, also something very close to our hearts and also to our thesis. But don't go anywhere, folks, because this conversation is far from over. We have part two of the data economy starting at the top of the hour. This is the Open Web Forum at COGEX, curated by Pirate Ventures, and I'll see you all in 20 minutes.